All right, everybody, welcome to our Monday Zoom and Learn. Uh, my name is Tommy Dutcher. I'm the Area Sales Manager for California Title. And my co-host, Mary Jane Morris, with um, the escrow spectrum is not with us today. She's out doing some signings and got tied up with work, so we will miss her. But today, uh, Samantha Hayes is going to um, give us a training, really, I think a final follow-up training, right, to, uh, to the 2023 uh, laws and regulations. Is that correct? Uh, no, we're doing the contract. Oh, the it's contract. the new RPA and all the forms and Perfect. all of that. All right. Well, without further ado, I will pass it over to you. Well, let me introduce Andrew as well. So, and Andrew, do you want to say a couple words? Uh, Andrew is our uh, is is a lawyer, a real estate attorney that uh, that we have partnered with here on Mondays. He comes on and gives us his perspective from a from a law perspective. And um, every so often, when he has time, he gives us uh, trainings uh, as well. So, uh, Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, essentially, I'm an attorney. Uh, my main practice areas are uh, trusts and estates, probate, uh, business law, and I'm also trained in various uh, real property matters. And I just put my cell phone down in the chat and uh, very excited to, to listen to Samantha today. Uh, but essentially, I just want to be a resource for everybody here. Uh, so call me anytime. And uh, I put my contact in the chat as well, as well as the location in which we store all of these recordings that we do, which we have over a hundred of them now uh, over the last uh, year or so. So, all right, uh, Sam, without further ado, please take okay. it away. Let me go ahead and I'll share my screen because I think pretty much everybody knows me. I'm Sam Hayes. I have One Stop Transaction Services. I am celebrating this year my 20th year. Super excited for that. And we're right. going to talk about the new RPA and everything else today. So let's go from there. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a certified transaction coordinator, certified forms trainer. I'm now a certified probate trust specialist. Basically, I'm a big nerd. I love this stuff. And all I do is sit at home and talk about paperwork all day. It's what I do. So if you have any questions, even if I'm not the TC on the file, please feel free to give me a call. I'll talk about this stuff till I'm blue in the face. When we started all of these trainings, when all of this started to launch back in October, this is based off of the lawsuit that is currently in process with the NAR, DOJ, and all the big names that are named. There is an issue going on right now about deciding regarding how commissions are paid, what has been disclosed properly, um, is it been a, does it affect the sales price, all the things along those lines. With that, just as this, everything got prepped, because the whole reason CAR decided to do these forms and these updates this last month was to be ready because it was expected to have a decision sometime potentially early spring. Well, three days after all of this dropped, December 22nd, uh, they've changed that. So right now, there's now the lawsuit is being delayed. Uh, they have gone back and some of the, and Mary Jane's a little bit more versed in this than I am, so she definitely is your point of contact for clarification. But my understanding is, they have decided to go back and review if it should have been met with arbitration versus going directly to court based on some of the listing agreements that were signed by the different um, relationships between the sellers and the different brokerages that are named. With that being said, remember, California removed our arbitration clause out of our listing agreements about a year and a half ago. I do know the big block has that added back in. Something to think about. Uh, this is definitely going to take a look at how all the different brokers are running their businesses moving forward. We've got a lot of, I don't know. It's it's a lot of, I don't know. Right now, the new update from the Eighth Circuit is not expected to late fall. So some of the things I'm going to share now, I'm going to kind of glaze over since we they aren't impacting us directly. However, it's never going to hurt to be ready to negotiate and have a buyer's understand that they may be paying part of your commission, or it may also be a different negotiation strategy, depending on how the market goes moving forward. Never going to hurt to learn a new tool, never going to learn hurt to learn a new negotiation style. So what happened was before we had multiple buyer broker representation forms that you could use, there was exclusive, not exclusive, and such. Now we're down to just one, where the buyer representation broker compensation. And this is not it doesn't it refer to the compensation on the form specifically. What it does is say that they have the right to the compensation. So it's a whole, there's now four forms to break down how this relationship may play out. Again, 
be ready for a lot of changes over the next few months, depending on what happens with the lawsuits and decisions that come down. It's for a number of days. You can not have it end on a specific calendar day. You can say, look, I'm only going to show you for one day. I'm going to show you for a week. I'm going to show you for 30 days. You can do that, whatever. It defaults purposely to non-exclusive, meaning the broker is only entitled for payment if the buyer purchases the property where the brokerage was directly involved. So again, this is something the brokers are going to need to review. It's something you're going to need to figure out what is going to be your plan and strategy moving forward. There are multiple parts to this document. Breaking through is that it's if your exclusive agreement, if they're how you're allowed to cancel, any payment can be applied as credit towards compensation. Um, it authorizes the broker to include the seller to pay broker um, broker payment in the offer. So that's the whole RPA 3G3 you may be hearing people ask about now. We thought it was gonna go into effect right now. That's not happening. So just be aware that box, unless marked on your RPA, so 3G3 does not apply now. Do not start panicking. Don't start worrying about that till we get more information. And be aware that once, if that comes into play, we do have to disclose to the other, do the listing side, what was agreed to for when you're negotiating for commission, what you'd already had the buyer agree to cover your commission. So this one is actually a good form to also use, which is your buyer transactional agreement. And this is kind of like a BIA, but it's explaining what the, the buyer's agent's responsible for, what the buyer's a responsible for. We, in, especially in this type of market where service is so important and everybody's focusing on trying to generate connections and things, we need to remember to stay in our lanes and we need to remember what we are experts in and get our clients to experts and not overstep. So this kind of goes through the scope of duties and what you're responsible for as a buyer's agent and what the buyer themselves would be responsible for their investigations. So the anticipated broker compensation disclosure, this is probably something that is good to start practicing and getting used to, even though it's not going into play right now. This is going to come in that we need to disclose to the buyers every single time when you write an offer, the amount of compensation buyer's agent is entitled to per either the MLS listing or if you were doing a cooperating broker compensation. The impact on this is when you do negotiate the buyer to pay your fee, they need to know how much is being offered by the seller and if that will impact or reduce the amount the buyer may be responsible for. This is why this is such a hot topic because it's gonna change how everything's been done and the verbiage. The biggest issue was many agents, unfortunately, unknowingly would share that, oh, well, you don't have to pay my fee. Well, that's not true because there is an impact in the sales price, the listing agents paying it, what did they adjust for commission? So that's where the whole issue came up. So this is basically stepping towards more transparency and more communication about how our commissions are paid. This is also talking about the um, non-contingent offers and especially when you're making offers right now, we're not seeing it as much as we did before, but when you're making non-contingent offers, we need to make sure that this is signed before the offer is written because the problem is, I don't think buyers completely understand that taking away your contingencies means you're moving forward. You are going without any opportunity to get out of the transaction or any opportunity to make sure you've done your investigation. You're saying you're good no matter what. And the problem that has come up in the past is when you have agents that have not fully explained this to their clients, there's a huge liability there through a fiduciary duty. It's worth taking the time. I know it's extra paperwork and a lot of people don't want to read through, but having these signed prior to the offer and prior to writing up the contract is a huge way to insulate and do your risk management for the broker file. Another form that has this information that you can use with it, it doesn't replace, it's just one that can go hand in hand and you really should have signed with every RLA and every RPA, no matter where we're at, is your market condition advisory. What's great about the market condition advisory is it has the same information saying, hey, non-contingent offers, hey, if you do this, you're going at risk, you're going against broker advice. It also says agents do not set the price. We have no input on that. And then same for the seller. We can't tell you what the rates are going to be tomorrow. We can't tell you what's going to happen. It's a really great form. It does a lot of just clarification and proving that was signed before when you stack up your paperwork your RLA or your RPA is a great risk management practice, but as always verify everything with your broker of record. 
counter offer has changed a little bit as well. So there's now a difference between the offer price and the appraisal contingency amount. It will remain the same even if the purchase price changes. So if you say that the property has to appraise, let's say at 750, but you've made an offer at 800 and they come back and counter you at 825, it's going to stay that it has to appraise at at least 750. That's not going to be something, unless you change it in these counters, everything that stays in the RPA stays the same. So what do you mean, Sam? What are you trying to explain? If you do any changes of percentages, if you do any changes of amounts, you need to also reflect it in your counter. It's not going to automatically pull from the RPA. What's in the RPA stays the same. So that's why you need to be very explicit and detailed and very limited in your communication. More words is not always a good thing in your counter offers. You definitely want to be as factual and to the point and very crisp in your communication. Um, anytime we add any verbiage whatsoever to any of these contracts, it is the act of practicing law. And none of us majority are not attorneys. I know there are some agents out there that are also attorneys. You want to limit what you were doing. That's why you want to be very short, sweet, and to the point. It's a KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. You want to be very blunt about what you're asking for. Same thing with the credits. Just because your credits say they said 5%, well, that's going to be based off your original number. Or if they said 10,000, that's still going to be the same unless you specifically change it in the counter. So the residential lease after sale, this has been a huge problem that I've run into over the past few years. So if you do not have a deposit, you can't, or if you're not charging anything, if there's a complimentary rent back seller staying for no fee, how do you charge a deposit? Because a deposit can only be twice the amount of rent. You have no rent. So how do you have a deposit? That's been something that has been discussed, but wasn't explicit in the RLAS before. It is now outlined in this form. It also states that the condition of the property was disclosed at the RPA. So this is not coming in and saying, well, the house is a mess. No, you need to check that out before you close escrow. And they actually have created a new form for that. It's the, we have the MIMO, the move in, move out for whether it's tenancy. Well, they now have the PIMO, which is prior to close that you can use to do a walkthrough to go with your um, verification property condition. Also, it's explicit that the seller tenant is not responsible for smoking damage that already existed in the property. So if they suddenly discover smoking damage, even though it's been there the whole time, the seller and the tenant is not responsible for that. That's part of buying the property as it is. Okay. Extension of time was changed from an amendment to um, instead of being an addendum. What does that mean? Well, an addendum is we've added. That's addendum. Amendment, we're changing terms, which if you're extending your close of escrow, you are changing terms. It now has a time frame to respond. Same thing with cancellation of contract. These are now amendments. They are changing the terms of the contract. They have a time frame response like the 8A. So you need to pay attention to that because if that expires and nobody's responded, it's gone. It's off the table and you're going to have to start over. Things like this are little details, little bits, because every one of these is a result of a lawsuit. So be aware of that. Be savvy about your time frames. You can limit them. Typically, they default to three days. Same as like your counter offer. Uh, we went ahead on manufactured property that's already included conforming and contractual requirements. It's just been combined into one. And the manufactured home TDS has been reformatted. So it's much closer to the regular TDS um, cleanup form itself. Just a little bit more questions, clarifications, as we've all seen. So here's the fun stuff in the RPA. Some big things to pay attention to is HOA docs and seller disclosures. This is before it's been acknowledged receipt. Now they have the opportunity to and approve. So the buyer has to approve them. What does that mean? Well, if you have something where we know the seller has not completed the documents correctly, I recently had an issue where the seller said no to the HOA on every single form where um, it was unit number seven. So we knew it was in an HOA. And we kicked them back multiple times because it was not properly disclosing that it is in the HOA and the seller, or excuse me, the buyer did not want to approve them because they knew they were not correct. Take your time as a listing side. As soon as you take your listing, what I would recommend is do your disclosures as quickly as possible with your clients while they're still engaged. They haven't packed everything up. They can find the supporting documents. If they have any receipts, warranties, anything along those lines. 
ask the questions as if you were a buyer. If they fill something out, mark a box, yes, we need an explanation. Even if it was happened in 2007, no longer have paperwork. That's fine. That's facts. They can't answer anything they don't know, but it's a job of the agents and TCs can assist, but it's the job of the agents to review these items. It'll also help you when you're dealing with negotiating the purchase contract because you're already aware of the pitfalls that go with the property. Disclosures are the history of the property. They are the good, bad, and the ugly. So don't be expecting these to be your marketing pieces. We want the dirt. We don't want them nice. We, I'd rather they were rough and told scary things because it's better for your risk and exposing and sharing everything and not hiding any information by accident or unfortunately sometimes by intent. Other thing is buyer investigations also specifically include availability and cost of homeowner and flood insurance, fire insurance. Side note to that, um, the fire home hardening disclosure is all those maps with CAL FIRE are currently being revised. CAL FIRE and the Department of Insurance are currently working together uh, it's up for public response. And if you wanna message me, I can send you all the forms and things that I've been finding. This is gonna impact this specific line because the buyers are gonna to need to, especially if you're dealing with anything that's from 52 to the 78 where we had the big fires in 07 and 11, uh, anything in the outlying areas, anything unincorporated, if you're dealing with here in San Diego County or any of the counties you're working in, anything that you know is more rural, expect to see some increases in these prices for the homeowner's insurance. I am aware of two different HOAs that currently are having a very difficult time trying to obtain homeowner's insurance for the entire property. This is gonna be a really big topic. It's good to stay ahead of it and stay educated on it. Uh, let's see, clarification, which we all knew already that contingency timeframes include five days after delivery, whichever is later. So if you're listing side and say CAVID or AVID to follow with your TDS and you don't give it till day 13, 14, 15, you just extended the contingencies for disclosures another five days for one that's delivered. Because if you write that on that contract or on that TDS, that you have an ABID attached but haven't delivered it, that's technically an incomplete document. You want to do your ABIDs as quickly as possible. The ABID itself is not civil code required. The action of the agent's visual is what civil code required. So that's the benefit of the ABID is to prove you've completed your civil required duty. That's what that's one of the two things you have as an agent to do that are actual civil code. Uh, let's see, tests are part of inspection. So if you have any type of tests that you've done to the property, lead, well, anything like that, you also got to hand that over. Again, material fact. And if the seller is known about the insurance claim, as we all know, you're supposed to provide the information. If for some reason you're dealing with a probate, a trust, an REO, what you can have in lieu is filled out as the RAC, it's the authorized receive um, recipient consent form, I believe. And what that will do is allow the insurer to talk to the new buyer and they can do their own research if you have an entity situation where they just don't have the info. So there's no default amount for points. And um, if you're doing the buy downs and everything that's going on lately, these are things you're gonna wanna pay attention to. A lot of these areas we've left blank over the past few years because, well, rates were so low and everything was so low, it really didn't affect. You're going to want to pay attention to that moving forward because this could protect your client. And if something shifts, luckily today I heard we got under six, so I'm kind of excited about that. But if things start shifting back a different direction, you're going to want to make sure you put caps on this on your buyer side to protect your buyer and give them an option to get out if they just are unable to obtain a loan that meets their needs. This is 3G3. We don't have to worry about it right now. If we do, this is where you would mark the box ask the seller to pay for the buyer broker or pay for the buyer's broker's compensation, you would have to provide the um, BRBC that you signed with that client and disclose that you have set a set amount moving forward. Right now, this is on hold, but this is the big spot. You're going to have everybody freaking out. As long as you have not marked this box right here, it doesn't apply. So don't mark the box. Easiest way to explain it right now. When we know more, we will definitely do a presentation as quickly as possible, but it's just on hold. This is the form, which again is on hold currently. One thing that was added to remind everybody, if the buyer's agent for some reason doesn't know any of the units are occupied by anybody else other than the seller, the, the buyer, the excuse me, the listing side will need to include the TOPA. What is the TOPA? 
Okay, so that's tenants are in possession or occupying the property right now, the tenant occupied property addendum. That includes family members that are not on title. That includes friends that are not on title. They're not tenants, but they just stay with us. They, you still need to do that. If any human who is not on title occupies that property for even a minute while you were in escrow, you need a TOPA, no matter what. It's non-negotiable. That's the thing people, well, it's not really a tenant, it's the kids. They're still the kids. And I've had the kids squat and not want to get out of the property because they can't afford to find another place to rent. And then you're ending up with tenant squatters. And this is going to protect your buyer because this form goes through explaining how to deal with that type of situation. Or if the seller will then be responsible for reimbursing the buyer for reasonable costs, inspections, appraisals, those type of things. We need to use this form. If it's anybody other than the anybody named on title occupying the property, you need this form. Home warranty. So this comes up a lot and everybody I think gets a little confused. The home warranty is merely a credit from the seller moving forward. It is on the buyer side to select the services, order the payments, order the forms. It really is basically just, this section is pretty much to clarify either that you're not asking the seller to pay, that's fine. The amount, if you are asking the seller to pay, which is fine. But other than that, all the responsibility for getting this document, or getting this order, this coverage ordered and sorted, that's on the buyer side because the buyer should be reviewing the different warranty brochures and whatnot and making sure they're finding the coverage that works for what they're looking for and what meets the needs of the house. I do know that um, Old Republic is in the process of raising their fees. I was told First American will be raising their fees approximately May. I have not heard back from Fidelity yet and American Home Shield will be sending me over their brochures. I if you need them, again, give me a, send me a message. Happy to send them out to anybody. Double check your home warranty amounts before you write your offers or you could be stuck paying $100 to cover your clients. Right now, the contract defaults for the buyer to do that. So it's not out of the agent's pockets the way it used to be automatically before, but it depends on your working relationship and that could be your closing gift. So verify all with your broker record how you guys want to move forward. But this is a buyer responsibility now to do all the order. Paying is, it's just seller credit. Okay, so we do this a lot too, that like, hey, we're keeping your deposit. Once you remove all contingencies, hey, that's non-refundable. We're not attorneys. So with us not being attorneys, slight issue about that. You've got to go ahead and have this reviewed by legal before this verbiage was already in there. But now there's also, remember, you have to see if it satisfies possible liability and remedies. What if the buyer doesn't put a deposit in? And does it meet the civil code verbiage? I don't know the civil code. I'm not an expert in these civil codes. That's why you and your broker will need to review how you want to do this as a brokerage and what your legal counsel advises and specific verbiage if you're going to be trying to retain any deposits when you're doing an escrow. If the buyer intends to occupy any of the units, that unit, it, one, needs to be selected. So if you've got a two-on-one or three-on-one and the buyer says, well, I'm going to be the owner-occupant, okay, we need to know exactly which unit they're going to occupy because that needs to be clarified so that we know exactly which one if we need to be having a tenant evicted or if they need to be given notice or what the situation is. And then we still need that TOPA no matter what, unless everything is vacant. So again, if anybody is remaining on the property that is not on title after close of escrow, need a TOPA. Even if it's for a minute, even if it's for a day, you need the TOPA. Um, the seller also needs to disclose any units occupied by persons, tenants other than the seller. So if maybe they didn't know that the other property is occupied for some, or excuse me, other units occupied, or maybe they didn't know that was family or whatever, again, we've got to clarify it. So it needs to be very clear within three days of acceptance, who's on the property and who's going to be vacating and how we're going to handle this. Window coverings include hardware and rods. We're all laughing at this, but I actually have a transaction right now where um, unfortunately it's a divorce situation and the seller has just decided that they are emotionally attached to the rods and the curtains and want to keep everything because it'll make their life better. And we're having to explain that 
no, I'm sorry, that's not part of it. And you didn't call it out. If she called it out expressly in the contract, that would have been a different story, which you can do. And you're going to want to have a very clear communication with your listings and with your sellers of, hey, do you want this? Do you want that? And then I would do on top of what you note in your RLA, I would do a follow-up email recapping so that it's very clear for both sides. Verify all with your broker of record, but you can never over communicate. And having that email versus text, it's much easier to put in the broker of record and just be able to go, hey, uh, we talked about this. Bye. It's not yours. I mean, I've also had a doorbell taken and I've had a whole bar where they fought over the booze. So, I mean, I've seen a lot as we all have. Um, also, the pool heater is included. That's not, that doesn't go with you. I, I'm not sure where that one came from, but. Anything here is a result of a lawsuit or something that happens. So I, I don't know about those. Okay, solar, our favorite thing. I know how all of us enjoy dealing with the solar and getting all the information. Right now, if there is solar on the property, this is not officially, but per the car training on the new forms, per my buddy Neil, this is now, if there's solar, you've got to do this disclosure. When do we find out if there's solar? during the listing process. So you're gonna to need to find out and get them started. You're gonna to need to provide all the contracts, the leases. They need to reach out to the solar company, even if they own it, and go ahead and start the transfer process. I have now had, oh, I think we're up to five. Oh, I paid for it. It's all paid off, it's all paid off. We pulled the prelim. It got transferred to another company. They thought they paid off. The other one that's been servicing it has built up a ton of charges and then late fees. And suddenly one was 30,000, one was 5,000. And then the other one was an unrecorded lien whatsoever that now we're having to see if the buyer can assume. This is an unregulated industry that is trying to get more organized. You need to do your due diligence. You need to do a lot of investigation regarding solar. As soon as, if you walk to the house and you'd see the panels, you know there's solar. We need to start the conversation as soon as possible with them. Sellers don't know. They just know they've had power to their house. This isn't something they deal with every day. So that's our job as agents and in the industry is to help educate them and explain the potential liability and the impact on the sale. This form will help. So this is kind of going that it's added into the contract saying that, hey, we know you've got solar, so we got to provide this form. This now can delay your contingencies. This now can delay and give them an out. And they get five days from receiving this. And right now the form is not set up in Glide, super easy to do answering of questions. So beware, this could be a stumbling block. What's great is the first page is kind of like your agent's visual. It gives you all the advisory stuff. This is kind of explaining to the buyer and also reminding the seller the types of solar panels and systems, how the payments generally work. Advertising materials are not contractual. So if you say one thing on your MLS, doesn't mean that's what's actually happening. Uh, what gets transferred with the sale and why it's so important to investigate and review these. Hey, Sam, before you move further. Uh, yep, go. A couple of questions in the comments. Cool. So back to um, floor coverings and stuff. It said, what would be an attached floor covering? What would be an attached floor covering? Yep. Well, that would be anything that's nailed down. I mean, if a rug, if you can pull it, so it's fixtures. So if it's attached physically, like rods are attached is the way they're defining it because you've got the screws in and then some are nailed into that hook. So that's considered attached. A floor covering, like if it's already got tile or you've got like hardwood, that's gonna be attached. But if you've got a rug that you can just pick up and there's nothing attaching into the floor, that sh should be personal property. I would, but I am not going to make a general rugs, statement. You know, big area rugs, things like that are not attached to floor. No, they're not attached, but. Carpet is attached by tack strip. So yeah. regular carpet is attached. Any type of wood flooring or laminate is attached. Any type but, of uh, linoleum is attached. Tiles attached. But if, if it is something that is being negotiated in the contract, pay attention to that. Or if your buyer really wants that rug, you need to have a conversation about that and acknowledge that it was talked about. Again, that's personal property that would have to be outside of escrow. That's a totally separate thing, but pay attention to your clients when you're doing the walkthrough. If they're assuming that rug is going to convey because it looks like it, you know, touches every corner. One thing I want to double check throw out there that. in regards to attached and not attached is yeah, it falls into a gray area is those throw rugs that go down the stairs, right? 
They're With usually the held on by by rod bars that go across the, the crease of the stair, et cetera, you know, where the carpet itself is not attached, right? The rod holds it in place. It, it walks a gray area. I think this is opening the conversation of, you know, people being able to take certain things that, you know, one would look at and say, that's part of the stairs, right? And another would look at and say, no, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's a track rug that I'm taking because it was built in Italy or whatever it was, right? Um, so I think it's just, there's been some confusion in the past. Obviously, that's why it's in here. Um, well, that's the other, why you need the other to be question. That's, I mean, really, that's why you need to be explicit on either side. If there's anything that comes up when you're doing the walkthrough with your client, you need to pay attention. Yeah. The other question was in the solar category here. Um, Danny was asking, you know, what if we're on the buy side and we don't get it from the listing side? Like, are we going to get your broker does not require it or, nope. you know, nope. things so like if you that? Go, I mean, so if we go back, so right here, it's in the contract now that the seller shall, within the time specified, deliver to the buyer all known information of solar system. They can use this questionnaire. Her and Neil were expecting this to become one of the disclosures the way it's in the section with the TDS, the SPQ, and everything else currently right now, but it is required for them to do this. This is the contractual requirement at this point. Mm -hmm. Hey, it, it says may. Got the word may in there. Sellers shall, within the time, deliver all known. They may use the form. That's why I'm saying the form's not required yet because they didn't do that verbiage. But from what Neil said at training, we expect that in June it will be it will be considered required and just Got treated it. as required. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So they have to deliver all known information. Okay. Right. But they may use the solar advisory questionnaire to do that. They, they have, don't to, have to use the solar questionnaire to do it, but they have to supply all known information about the solar panels and the solar system. So to clarify that, they have to provide all known, the contracts, everything else. If they use the solar form, that also requires them to still do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So come hell or high water, they've still got to give the contracts, they've still got to give the leases, they've still got to give everything else. To take it a step further for best risk management, that's why this form was created. It's the same with the agent's visual. The AVID itself, the form is not required. The action of the agent's visual is required. Well, how do you prove you did it? Same thing with this. How do you prove you did it? So it's going to be broker calls, but right now, all my agents, when we're talking about it, we're going forward with anybody who's got solar, we're having them do the form. It's just best practice. Plus, it also gives a bunch of disclosure on there that will help insulate. But I am not, check with the broker of record on the file you were working on. Also, you can verify with CAR. This is my understanding at this time. Yeah, I thought I heard something that said uh, in the forms, there will be a, a selection that says, does the property have solar? And if it's checked, yes, it's automatically going to start uploading some of these new forms eventually. Eventually, yes. It's not yet, but I hope that would be yes. But the best practice would be to start doing this form during the listing period, because it's like with now with the NHD for the fire home hardening, we order the NHD to find out if we need the fire home hardening. Same thing with this. If you have a conversation with your seller, this is the same type of thing that should be being done during the listing process to make sure and start collecting all the documents. Shocking, we need to tell escrow for assigning the contract. They need to know, title needs to know, everybody needs to know. Um, nomination is similar to assignment where they can say we're gonna nominate, we may consider. We're treating nomination the same way as assignment. If anybody is taking this over, they need to know what's going on. They need to be brought into the loop. This is just clarifying it and being as explicit as possible. Also remember that assignment has a time limit on it in the RPA now. That currently it defaults 17 days that you have to assign the contract in. Can you do it after the fact? Sure. Seller doesn't have to though, you're outside of time frames. Seller doesn't really have to in the beginning, but there's really no reason. They can then decline it if you're outside of your time frame. So if you're working with a client who might be assigning to an LLC, uh, transferring between investors, excuse me, have a conversation with them ahead of time. Try and get a game plan before you go under contract or at least manage everybody's expectations. 
so we don't have to duplicate all the files. Escrow, I've had multiple escrow companies that are like, oh, okay, well, we've assigned the contract, so it's fine, it's one page. No, that's that's their file. The DRE audited file, because we have the, this form, um, RPA 23 for assignment, we have to then do the AOAA, which is the assignment of agreement addendum. Then from that, we have to go ahead and that new party who is being assigned, if they are already not a primary signer in the original offer, has to sign everything. That's the contract, that's escrow, that's all your disclosures, everything, the whole file has to be redone. So that's something I think that gets missed, that people don't realize the impact of, we need proof. Now, the AOAA only says uh, that the new party only has to initial on the first page of each document. I'm a big fan and I've always done my files this way. If you're a new buyer, you sign where all the other buyers did. I don't want some lawyer to be able to tear it apart that somebody didn't see something. But verify all with the broker of record that you're working with. Okay, legal holiday. This is really impact us right now because we're in that nice window where we have a legal holiday almost every month. Different areas have different holidays. They have different dates when things are closed. San Diego does Cesar Chavez Day. That's when our county recorder's closed. I believe San Bernardino and Riverside did Christmas Eve and Christmas. You've got to double check. If escrow, the lender, or county recorder are closed, that's considered a holiday because you can't close. Yeah, you might want to, and that's fine yeah. with the contract, but the problem is we cannot close. Like one of the pieces is missing to record the documents. And I so just the, the, uh, the updated um, closure for each Southern California uh, county. Yep. So I posted it to my Tommy for Title um, Facebook page. You guys can find it there. Um, but yeah, it is across the board different for every county. You know, LA will be closed the day where Riverside's open. San Diego will be closed the day where Riverside's open. Riverside will be closed when San Diego's open. It's there's no rhyme or reason to it other than the counties themselves of what they've chosen for that county's offices to be their own holidays, right? And we have a lot of holidays that are falling on the weekends, and some of them are closing Friday and some are closing Mondays. You know, so you got to be very cautious and know that going into it when you're setting. Um, your, you know, 30 days, 45 day out closure dates, you're going to want to make sure that it's not falling around or on one of those, you know, closure dates, right? And um, so uh, I'll, I'll see if I can post it here. Um, while we're still on here, post it in the chat. But again, Tommy, the number for title, search that on Facebook, you'll find my business page, it is posted there last week. Well, and also bear in mind too, one of the things that takes into account if the escrow is closed, what if they have a training? Yeah. That now counts as legal holiday. What if the lender, you know, does it recognizes a holiday that maybe escrow and title don't? So you're gonna wanna have these conversations and we're about to go into, you have Martin Luther King Day coming up, you have President's Day coming up. So if you go under escrow in the next week or so, you could be impacted by two different holidays. Mm -hmm. It's always good to take a look at the calendar when you're writing offers, make sure you double check and go through there. I mean, think when you're dealing with November, we've got three holidays tied in. So it's make sure you're just Even double checking. You know, weekend coming up. Some will be closed yeah. Friday and Monday. Some will just be closed one day. Exactly. Right? It's worth a conversation to say, hey, these are our dates. Is anybody also if anybody's gonna be traveling, if you're gonna have people, you know, this ties into that too. It kind of does a fish tail of are you gonna be traveling? Are you are your clients gonna be traveling? We've got to plan ahead. And I've had multiple. Uh, clients that were out of the country recently setting up with the consulate you can't just get something notarized in another country it needs to be at the u.s consulate or mm -hmm. if you have somebody stationed abroad or overseas it's got to be on the base and getting appointments for these especially when you're dealing with holiday times because there are different schedules in different countries can take a lot longer than you think covid protocols have some conversations ask the questions, get the details so you can plan ahead. It smooths everything out. And the sooner you get everybody in the same loop, we can plan together and work together as a team. Ah, uh, my most, most favorite that's making everybody absolutely insane. Please, 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 please. When you were writing an offer or you were accepting an offer, or even if you're countering, remember, personal receipt was changed when we redid the contract at the beginning of 2021. So we no longer have those initials acknowledging receipt. What they did was it was delivery of electronic designated electronic delivery address. 
So that means whatever email is on this section right here or this section right here, as long as that has an email address and that's the one, if the buyer side sends it over to the listing side or the listing sends to the buyer side, as soon as they hit send, that's considered delivered. But it has to have this information here. If we don't, then we're back to personal receipt. I can't prove personal receipt without having some clarification. Then we're going back to saying, is it in their hand? How do you know they personally received it? You are making, you are impacting all of your time frames. You're impacting delivering notices to perform. You're impacting contingency time frames. You're impacting everything because we cannot prove receipt without having this information filled out. And it's not default because what if you're traveling and you have somebody else's email you're using? Or what if you change companies? Or what if you're going to have um, a buyer's agent accept for you and you've designated for them on this one deal only? You have to type this in every single time. It is such a big deal that is getting blown off. Now, if it gets missed, it happens. We can do the DEDA, and that's the designated delivery addendum. And then we can clean it up right at the beginning of escrow. And I get told multiple times, well, my broker doesn't require it. Okay, that's fine, but we've just blown up our time frames because I have no way to prove that personal receipt. And if this goes to court, there's no way to show the paper trail or proof of any of this stuff. We're going back to some old school things. Okay, I'm seeing a bunch of th questions come up in the chat. So you wanna? Yeah, no, people are saying thank you, things like that. Um, I did post the county recorder's uh, schedule for Southern California in the chat though. So you guys can okay. download it there. Um, and yeah, no. Nope, okay, cool. Um, let's see, I thought we were going to be the last date on the contract, last semester day, okay. I thought we were going by the last date on the contract, last nope. signature date. Nope. So here's the problem. Okay. Seller signs. That's the last we've accepted. Let's just say there's no counters. Seller signs are accepted. Awesome. Agent gets it at midnight. Doesn't send it till the next day. Agent gets it on Friday night. Doesn't send it over till Sunday. Whenever it is sent, that's personal. That's acceptance. Acceptance is not the signature date. It's when it gets to the other party or when with this, we can say it was sent. So you've got two ways to do it. You either, you've got to be able to prove when it was sent over. That's when, it, that's the transfer. That's the personal receipt. It's not when it was signed. It's not the last signature. It may be, it can be sometimes. I mean, cause we're all trying to move this forward totally, but don't count on that signature being the acceptance date. Verify when it was personally, you know, either emailed because you have the correct email information here, or you get an email back or something saying, got it, we've opened, let's open escrow. Escrow is gonna be asking you for this information over and over again. They have no way to prove, they have no way to know when it was sent. It's something you're gonna get asked a lot about. And people are, I know TCs were getting frustrated till understanding they cannot go by the signature date on this because of how the contract changed. They've gotta know when it was either emailed over to whichever emails were put here or when, when the receiving party confirmed personal receipt. It's a big deal. It sounds like it's not, it's a really big deal. It can definitely impact the lawsuit. Any more questions? I see some other questions came up. Sam, I had a quick yeah. question. Shoot. Um, do you have to check the box that says email above? Is the, de is the delivery or just putting the email is the delivery date or the delivery? I would always check if we got it here, let's go ahead and check the email above to confirm. We can default here, and then you could also get into a fight saying this wasn't filled out. So I'm going to say yes. That's why it, the box exists. It's best to use it at this point. At least if I get an email in here, I'd be ecstatic. As I know, Tina, you've dealt with too, and we've all dealt with trying to explain how important this is. But I would go ahead and mark that. And some agents will give text to phone is okay. My broker does not like getting text to phone, so he doesn't mark that box. We don't want text to be acceptable for transferring information. We want emails. We want actual documents. Heather said, so what if there's a counter? Then the counter will have this, the same issue will still apply. So this is where all the info is. doesn't matter if there's a, uh, the counter will still be the same thing. That last signature will not be the one. It'll be when that count, accepted counter is sent to the other party. It's personal receipt. doesn't matter if we're 17 counters deep. doesn't matter if we're only no counters at all. 
that's why this is so important right here to be filled out because this is going to transfer and go with whatever counters you do. Yeah. Any more questions? If something pops up, if you have any questions after the fact, if you kind of wake up at three in the morning and go, but what about, call me anytime. I am um, under Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube at One Stop TC. Uh, my phone is, it literally is 993 Sammy. That does spell Sammy on it with an I. Um, I will talk this blue in the face. Again, I'm not the broker of record, but I'm always happy to help. Let me stop my share. And I'm going to pop up the chat so I can see. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Tyler, did that make sense about the counter? Yeah, he said thank you. Okay, cool. Um, I've been watching. I think that was pretty much it in there. Okay. But real quick, I'm going to share my screen real quick on the closures because we have quite a few coming up. So. Um, Happy to help, Rosie. You know, here here's our upcoming holidays. Um, you'll see that. The, everybody's closed for Martin Luther King Day on January 16th coming up. You'll see that President's Day, um, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Ventura are all open on February 13th and 100% closure on the 20th. Okay. So, you know, keep all these in mind as you're moving forward with, with these. But, you know, I did drop this in the chat. Um, you can obviously. Take a picture of it if you want so it's on your phone right now um, but this this always comes up every single holiday i have at least one file that was supposed to close and gets pushed because of the holiday right or there's a mad rush to try and get it closed two days early or something like that so you know maybe take a picture of this have it stored in your phone so you can always revert back to it. But this is this year's uh schedule for all counties in southern california That's great. I also want to just say real quick, uh, the presentation was wonderful and I heard several times throughout it, those pesky lawyers, they look at everything and they're always getting in our way and, you know, uh, we can't give legal advice or anything. Well, if you would like a pesky lawyer who's on your team, I'm here, very much want to help and uh, my cell phone's in the chat. Really good presentation, Sam. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. And I, I don't think lawyers are pesky. I just know I want to be aware of their needs and try and protect my agents from pretending to be one. No, we're yeah, pesky. The we read thing everything. Is. We're really hard to deal with. I get it. <laughs> so I'm a nightmare. I'm the, so yeah. I understand. All right. So we'll open it up for any questions. Um, that could be a question for Sam, myself, or or for Andrew. Um, if anybody has one, um, Sam and I always will stay on until the end as well. But um, you guys can feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask away. But until then, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining us and make sure that you join us um, next Monday as well. Same time, same Zoom.